Has there ever been anybody in the history of history who's been converted by a street preacher? I mean, has there ever been somebody who walked in and saw some cat on a soapbox with a sign screaming in a microphone, you're all going to hell, and they drop to their knees and go, you know, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I have to make a clarification. First of all, the thinking atheist is not a person. It is an icon which encourages all to think, to think about the problems that we face. You know, I live in a world with people like Dr. Steven Pinker and Stephen Hawking and Carolyn Porco. You know, they're sending satellites around Saturn and all of these amazing minds. And, you know, I, I am not the thinking atheist. Uh, I am... I'm the dumbass who took 30 years to figure out that people couldn't live to be 900 years old. You know? I always like to make that distinction. Before I get started very quickly, uh, I wanted to say a huge thank out to Nick Chartrand in Los Angeles. Before the tour, he'd heard about the fact that we were coming, and he mocked up some tour posters for us, and I wanted to bring them. There's Matt Dillahunty. <laughs> holding his big book, O Skepticism. Thought that was quite good. He did one for Aaron. Got the boxing gloves. I don't know why the Rue has a, uh, has a priest collar on. That's bizarre. <laughs> and then here's the one he did for me. Is that awesome or what? And somebody on Facebook sent me a message and said, did you know that you look in this image like Gordon Freeman from the video game Half-Life? Check that out. How badass am I? Walter White. Walter White. You know, we have a saying in my house, uh, Natalie and I, whenever something amazing happens or whenever something small happens, but it's a positive thing, we always look at each other and go, oh, that's the goodness. You walk into the house to the smell of chocolate chip cookies. You go, oh, who, who's making cookies? That's just goodness right there. You know, you finish the day. I finish the day with her feet in my lap or watching The Walking Dead and the episode doesn't suck that week. That's the goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I spend time with the people we care most about. You know, that's the goodness. Being here tonight with all of you, this is the goodness, man. This is, this is a gathering of friends, of people who get each other. And we get a chance to get out of the house and and uh, I'll, I have a confession. This is absolutely true. I was coming here and I put together a presentation, just agonized over it for about two weeks. Natalie will tell you. I was buried in the office. I wrote it. I rewrote it. I did all these meticulously sort of formatted PowerPoint presentations for the slides. And I've got all. The, and I went back and f rewrote it and refixed it. And, and I finished it. I walked into Natalie and I said, well, the speech is done. And I'm not going to give it. And she said, why? And this is the absolute truth. I said, because the whole time I'm, I'm writing this, and I, I will give the presentation down the way in another city at another time, the, the truth is, is that I've had other things on my mind. There's something else nagging at me. It kind of bothers me a little bit. And, you know, after all the, uh, the comedy and the jokes and whatnot, you know, I, it's a little risky for me to do this presentation because it's not exactly a, 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 an easy presentation to give. There aren't a lot of jokes. Normally, I'm the sort of the, the squishy guy who comes out and tells all the jokes and makes all the gags. But tonight will probably be the most um, serious presentation I've given. But if you will stick with me for the journey, 
You'll stick with me. I think you'll be glad that we met each other on the other side. Okay? The reason that I have had a hard time focusing on all these other gags and all these other sort of things that I had been doing is because there is something else that, at least in my part of the world, people are thinking about all the time. It just sticks to them like glue. And they have a real, they have a real fear in their marrow about images like this. David Haynes, British aid worker, he was beheaded by ISIS a few seconds after this photograph was taken. It's unspeakable. It's unthinkable. We look around at the world, the news, we browse social media. It just seems like everything's gone nuts. What's happening out here? We see acts that can only be described as evil, and then we become fearful. We become afraid when our kids leave. Are they going to walk into the wrong building? Are they going to drive down the wrong street? Will they travel to the wrong country? Will they meet the wrong person? The world feels like such a dangerous place. Well, I want to try to redefine how you and I see this world. But first, I want to go back in time. And I have a reason for doing so. I want to introduce you to this gentleman. His name is Charles Whitman. An American engineering student and former U.S. Marine, just after midnight on the 1st of August, 1966, he sat down and he wrote a suicide note. And he said, you know, I don't know why I do the things I do. I don't know what drives me. In fact, when I'm dead, I want the doctors to autopsy me and try to figure out what went wrong. And as soon as he finished the, present, or the, uh, the suicide note, he went and he killed his wife and his mother in their beds. And then he went to the University of Texas at Austin, and he climbed this tower to the observation deck, and he took these weapons. Host of rifles, shotgun, eight boxes of ammunition, over 700 rounds. And for 96 minutes, he rained down terror. Can you imagine that moment when the shots rang out, 1966? People couldn't believe it was happening at the time. Pandemonium, chaos. 96 minutes, he shot 45 people, 16 dead, including his wife and mother, before he was finally taken out. And he forever became known as the Texas Sniper. One man, and so much harm, so much pain, so much fear. I'm from Oklahoma. I was on the radio at KXOJ on the 19th of April, 1955, or 1955, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. 1995, we were on the radio when uh, Timothy McVeigh drove up in front of the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City with a fertilizer bomb and a big truck, big rental truck, set it off, destroyed the building. I mean, you can see the devastation. 168 people killed, many of them children. He and his accomplice, Terry Nichols, convicted of the crime. Two people. Two people. So much pain. Adam Lanza killed his mother at their house and then killed 20 kids at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Six staff members died as well before he took his own life. One person. Unimaginable pain. Remember the Boston Marathon bombings just a few years ago. One of these guys is on trial right now. 264 people injured, three people killed, two guys, two people, pandemonium, chaos, a nation in fear, people wondering what's going to happen next, what's this world coming to? It almost feels like it's, it almost feels like we're circling the drain, you know? We were watching across the ocean with the crisis that you recently had here, and our hearts broke for you and those who lost their lives. One man, one guy. The shooting in a Pakistani school as they took the children into an auditorium and just gunned them down. Seven people, seven guys, and so much pain. The world we live in, we live in the era of the beheading video. It seems so crazy, and we begin to despair in our hearts and think, how is it fixable? 
Things have gotten worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, and sometimes I'm afraid to go outside. This is how many people feel in many parts of the world and in many parts of the country from which I hail. Many people are saying from the pulpit, it is the end times. It is the book of Revelation come true. This was all prophesied, right? We got floods. We've got famine. We've got wars and rumors of wars. It seems like the ground is sort of spilling down beneath our feet, crumbling below us. And the preachers say, these are most certainly the end of days. Repent, for judgment day draws near. That kind of talk and these kind of feelings, they're nothing new. The whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. I hear this type of talk where I come from in Oklahoma, except we say it with an accent. The whole world's going to hell in a handbasket, damn it. All you got to do is look on the news. Do you guys have rednecks in Australia? (laughs) Now, this kind of talk and these kinds of feelings are nothing new, and it's something we need to stop and remind ourselves about. Corruption, war, poverty, starvation, murder, terror. These things have been woven into the fabric of human existence for the whole of human existence. And people throughout recorded history wailed about how horrible things were and how these must be the end times. They dug up some clay tablets dated 5,000 years. The Assyrians were talking about how degenerate the earth was. Bribery and corruption. People are just shitty to each other. The world must be coming to an end 5,000 years ago. Imagine being alive in the third century, the Roman government dramatically increasing its persecution of Christians, right? They just haul them into the Colosseum. They throw lions on them. They slice them up with all manner of hideous weapons. 80,000 people in the round cheering like you and I might cheer at a football game. They thought it was the end times at the first millennium. Pope Sylvester II said, the end will occur January 1st, 1,000. After that, it was in 1005, 1006, when a terrible famine throughout Europe killed so many people. They thought those were the end of days. In fact, there was an old English poem that talked about some will be destroyed by hunger, some meaning the children. Imagine being alive in the 14th century during the time of the plague. Can you imagine? Did you guys have to go through this one? Right? The next millennium will be the end days. Terry Falwell, president of Liberty University, goes on television, and he's scaring the pants off of everybody and all these people who were watching the television and taking his word for it, and he sells this VHS video of how to prepare yourself for Y2K, and it's only $26.99. And he sold a ton of them, right? And then the event comes and goes without incident thanks to the work of very clever computer programmers who handled the situation. Did Falwell go back and refund everybody's money? No. It was referenced earlier tonight, Harold Camping. This guy's a treasure. Every time he opened his mouth, we win, right? (laughs) He blew that May 21st, 2011 prediction for the end of the world, but he scared the pants off a lot of people. A lot of people were nervous. Right? He was promoting a spirit of fear, and terror. What happens? Is it really going to be the end of the world? I'm actually kind of weirded out by this guy. Of course, he'd missed an earlier prediction back in 1994. And when he missed the May prediction, he bumped it to October and screwed that one up. After which he had to give an apology. I'm really sorry, folks. You guys have to worry about the, uh, the whole Mayan calendar thing? You guys go through that? <laughs> the Mayans say it's the end of the world. 2012. And whatever you do, don't turn on the Large Hadron Collider. <laughs> You'll create an enormous black hole. We'll all get sucked into it. It's the end of the world. We're all going to die. This is the constant message. I saw this great poster. And it doesn't include nearly all, not even a a large minority of the missed end time prediction dates. Look at all these crossed out here. Okay, really? Well, next time, this time I'm sure, sometime in the second century, oops, and they just crossed all of these off. And of course, you and I are still kicking. 
We're still here. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years of predictions of doom and gloom and the end of days. And it's just us getting by the best we can. Now, how do we feel about this crazy? Now, feelings get weird. We're in, the, we're, we're in a skeptical culture, a logical culture. Many people don't like talking about feelings, and I think that's a mistake. I don't think emotion drives us, but I think emotion is part of the human experience. We need to understand it. And it's okay to feel things about the stuff we think about. Many times we can become prisoners of our fear. I worry about my family. I worry about those I care about. I want them safe. I want them in a good place. I don't want the craziness in the world to ever touch them. And you all share that in relation to the people that you care most about. There are those who say, well, I wish we could go back to the good old days. My part of the country, it's they wax nostalgic about just, just a short period of time ago. Things were so much better. People were friendlier. They were certainly more wholesome, right? It was just a better place. None of this nonsense was going on around the world. Those were the good old days. We need to get back to the good old days. In fact, if we were really doing it right, we'd get back to the good old days of biblical morality. And I won't be pretentious enough to try to say anything that Matt and Aaron haven't already covered in great detail. You guys already know your Bibles probably better than most believers do. That's why you are non-believers. I wish we could get back to the Bible, the good book. After all, that's where all the goodness comes from. All right, well, let's say you have a disobedient child. I just thought this picture was funny. I mean, I... what do you do to a disobedient kid in the year 2015? Uh, you know what? I'm taking your iPhone for a whole day. No car for you. You're grounded. Extra chores, something along those lines. That's how we deal with disobedience today. But how do we deal with it in the good old days of Scripture? Well, in the book of Deuteronomy... 21, 18, if someone has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father and mother and will not listen to them when they discipline him, his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders at the gate of his town. They shall say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And then all the men of the town are to stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you. Imagine going to your neighbor. Hey, Steve, hey, you know, is Philip home and Bob? Little Susie, she's just back talking and she just won't do what I tell her. So we're going to take her out here to the middle of the yard and we're going to stone her till she's dead. You guys got a minute? <laughs> How insane is that? Well, those were the good old days. The good old days of crucifixions. So commonplace, they were a form of entertainment in this world. The Romans routinely crucified people. In fact, it's where we get our word excruciating. Crucifixion is part of that root word. It was, it was so ubiquitous, it wove itself into our language. You know, Alexander the Great was reported to have crucified thousands of people. The reports of you walking into a city, there would just be one after the other, crucified people, their arms outstretched, horrible, agonizing, painful deaths that often took days to happen. Imagine living those good old days, or the good old days of the Inquisition. Imagine they showed up in Melbourne, you know? They said, hey, uh, we're going to set up a tribunal, we're going to find some people, we're going to accuse them of heresy, we're going to torture them until they confess, and once they've confessed, once we've sort of wrestled that out of them, we're going to take them out here and set them on fire. It'll be great. Like the witch burnings, right? Tens and tens and tens of thousands of people accused of sorcery and witchcraft in our recent history. And the crowd would gather. It was a form of entertainment. And it was done in the name of God. Check out this guy, Lord Timur of Central Asia. They called him the scourge of God. He slaughtered everybody. He was, he was just murder incarnate. Buried people alive. He'd, he'd set them in concrete till the concrete would set. 
And then he would just leave them to rot. He sliced them up. He beheaded them. In fact, when he entered Baghdad, he had 90,000 people beheaded. 90,000 so he could build a tower out of their skulls. Now, what we've seen in the headlines with ISIS and the Taliban and whatnot are unspeakably bad and horrible. But imagine that times tens of thousands. And this is recent history. Steven Pinker's got a brilliant book out called The Better Angels of Our Nature, where he lists like 200 different graphs and some very well-researched statistics that talk about how we doing today as opposed to the good old days. Are we really more violent? Is there more pain? Is there more heartache? Is there more terror? Is there more war? Is there more of the bad stuff today than there used to be? And the book is, it's not easy to get through. It's very, very thick, but it is compelling and amazing. I mean, you look at the Second World War, where just over 2% of the world population was killed. You think about the horrors of Auschwitz, the ovens of Auschwitz, and the Holocaust, and you say, wow, certainly God's chosen people, the Jews thought this was the end times. How could God let this happen? It must be the end of the world. But if you look back to the Lucian Revolt in the 8th century, 17% of the world population was killed. Hugely higher. Tribal warfare was nine times as deadly as war and genocide in the 20th century. The murder rate in medieval Europe was 30 times what it is today. Sort of a culture of bloodlust back then. Very primitive. Slavery, sadistic punishments, frivolous executions became targeted for abolition. We wanted to make them illegal. Rape, battering, hate crimes, deadly riots, child abuse, cruelty to animals, all substantially down. Well, I'm not talking about those olden days of hundreds and hundreds of years ago. No, no, no. I'm talking about the good old days, you know, just recently, a few decades ago. Like when the stock market crashed, 1929, and then the following Great Depression, which lasted a full decade. People out in the streets, their children having nothing. Women weren't even allowed to vote until just a few decades ago in the United States. Boggles the mind. The good old days of segregation, white schools, colored schools, lynchings. From 1882 through 1968, there were 4,743 lynchings in the United States. 73% of those people were black. Race-based, hate-based lynchings, public lynchings. Do those happen today? They happen, but they are the anomaly, not the rule. Do people of color have to use a separate water fountain or enter the back of a restaurant? Take a separate vehicle? Are they denied access? Racism is still an issue. But we have evolved. We have grown. We've become better about racism than we used to be. We ain't close to being there yet. But we are better than we used to be. Polio killed 350,000 people every year in our recent past. And then we developed that polio vaccine. As of the year 2013, those cases dropped to 416 total cases. Domestic violence is down, murder, down, statistically across the planet, down, less war. We abolish slavery, women's rights victories, opportunities for women that were not there mere decades ago, the advancement of LGBT rights, and we're fighting those fights even today for them, better food technologies, the forecasting of natural disasters. It used to be if you wanted to know if a storm was coming, you stuck your head out the window. Now we see them days in advance because of cameras. We float in outer space. How awesome is that? And don't crucify me for float. I know they're orbiting and there's gravity. And there's whatever. <laughs> You'd be surprised what I hear on my YouTube comment section. You know, Vaccines, we're living longer. We better understand the body and the brain. Reason is rising. These might be the good old days today. The world today, believe it or not, is a more civilized, more peaceful, more reasonable place than it has ever been. So why doesn't it feel that way? I think it's a combination of things. 
I think because we're a more civilized culture, when we see the crucifixions and the burnings and the beheadings and the horrible stuff, it's so much more of an anomaly that we blanch even more at the sight and the thought of it. It used to be sport in our recent history. You'd do it for fun. They'd put it in a stadium and sell freaking tickets. Now it's so much the anomaly that civilized people worldwide just recoil at the idea. Social media? Something horrible was done to someone else a few years ago, a few decades ago. You'd find out about it, but it'd take a while, a few hundred years ago. It took months and months, perhaps years and years before you ever knew it happened, if at all. In the Twitterverse, if something horrible happens to anyone or anything, you know about it in five seconds. I've gotten to the point now when I'm scrolling social media, I'm nervous because who knows who's going to post some horrible video about somebody getting knifed or stabbed or slaughtered or beheaded or something done to an animal or whatever. Do you ever feel that way on social media? Ah, you know, I hope, I hope I don't encounter something like that. That's not why I use Facebook. But it's there. Right? We check a lot of our news on social media before we go to the news sites. It's immediate. And therefore, it is amplified and feels much, much worse. But I want to come back to this guy, Charles Whitman, one guy. I don't surrender August 1st, 1966 to this man. I just don't do it. You know, he was impactful. He did something that will be remembered, yes. But I don't surrender that day to this man. I think that day belongs to this guy. One of the guys who helped his sort of escort the, the wounded off to safety, get them to hospitals. I surrender it to those guys. That day belongs to them. Those who stepped in potentially the line of fire to get people away from danger. That day belongs to them. That day belongs to those who put people in ambulances and said, how can I help you? Hundreds, thousands of people. I don't surrender the Oklahoma City bombing to these guys. That date in 1995 does not belong to Tim McVeigh and Terry Nichols. That day belongs to these guys. The rescue worker who put themselves in peril to climb over the rubble to look for survivors. These people who wrapped their arms around the wounded and suffering and said, let me help you. Those who participated in courts of law, celebrated justice, to make sure the justice would be done. Those who left memorials, personal effects, ribbons, cards, those who actually constructed the Oklahoma City Memorial, a chair for every victim. In fact, they have smaller chairs for all the children, illuminated at night. It's a beautiful garden, very moving. I don't surrender the Boston bombing to these guys. That day belongs to those who didn't know if from one second to the next, if another pressure cooker bomb was going to go off or some other horror would happen. But they stayed to help those who were in pain. And they wished them off to safety by the hundreds and thousands. By hundreds and thousands, I'm also talking about the healthcare professionals, the doctors, the nurses, the people who developed the medicines, the uh, antibiotics, the painkillers, those who served at the bedside of those who had been maimed, horribly maimed, like this physician right here. Those who hung their shoes, their running shoes, on the fences of Boston to remember those who had been so horribly harmed. I give that date to those people. Jeff Bauman, 27, he lost both of his legs, part of his hearing. Just over a month after the bombing happened, he went out and he tossed out the first pitch, the first ceremonial pitch at Fenway Park at a Boston Red Sox game to the cheers of tens of thousands and globally millions upon millions of people. I give that date to that guy. The Pakistani shooting, I give that date to those who went in to help children and save children instead of the cowardly act of harming children. That day belongs to them. Perhaps you're familiar with her. Malala Yousafzai, Pakistani girl, who had the audacity to say that girls deserve basic human rights and to get an education. And because she said so and publicly, one guy went in and shot her in the head at point blank range. I don't give 
that day to that man. I won't surrender it to him. I give that day to them who lit a candle as we didn't even know if she would survive the ordeal. And the people who rallied in the streets that said, we stand with you and we condemn this brutal attack. Male, female, young, old, all colors of the rainbow standing together on her behalf by the millions. They created large cards that said, we wish you a speedy recovery. We are proud of you. I give that day to them and to them and ultimately to Malala herself. I'm not saying we don't have real problems. We do. We have significant problems. I'm not saying the world isn't a scary place because it is. In many cases, we have good justification to be afraid. I'm just reminding you that if we look around at the things that don't make the headlines, we see that for every one act of terror and pain, and brutality and violence, we'll see thousands of acts of kindness. We are among family, not just friends, we are family, sticking together to promote positive change in our world, real change in a real world. My friends, that is something worth acknowledging. It's something worth remembering. It's something worth celebrating. That, my friends, is the goodness. Thank you very, very much.